everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome to my sewing room. This has hopefully been a long awaited video. I wanted to talk to you today about my whole process for the burgundy velvet gown that I have been working on. I kind of hinted at it at some previous videos and I've had some requests and comments uh, for me to make a video all about this process. So I hoped you wouldn't mind if we switched things up a little bit and I did some hand sewing while we have this chat. I have a lot of hand sewing left on this dress. Ah, I have a medium amount of hand sewing left on this dress and I am the world's slowest hand sewer. Uh, so figured I'd kill two birds with one stone and we could talk and sew at the same time. So if you have a sewing project, go ahead and grab it. And uh, I won't be directing a lot of my actual eye contact to you just because I can't see if I'm not looking at my project. Um, but I was hoping we could sew together. So uh, let me tell you about my process. So before I start in on the hand sewing itself, I wanted to show you what all started this project. And it is this awesome fashion plate. I'll try to get that nice and close which dates to 1874 and was gifted to me by the wonderful Denise Hendricks of Romantic Recollections. Uh, this is from La Mode Illustre um, and I had to actually go in and take apart the frame after I had already kind of started on this project to determine the exact year because the pictures that I could find of it online, um, the year was illegible and just way too tiny to, to be zoomed. Um, and obviously it's cut off at the bottom underneath the matting on this, on this frame. So I went in and took it out and, uh, found out that it was from 1874, which threw a little bit of a loop in this project because when I first looked at this plate, I completely ignored the lady in black who is wearing a pretty, like, decent 1870s bustle dress and stared only at the lady in the burgundy because you know she's obviously way more impressive in this uh, plate and to me the shape of her bodice and of her skirt was looking really um, really early 1870s like 1871 ish and so uh, my an original idea was oh this is a really round skirt this um, is definitely over a crinolette like a large crinolette almost practically elliptical um, and that's what I was going with. And it wasn't until I really broke it apart. Well, didn't break it apart. I took the frame and the matting off for briefly. It's all back together, obviously. Um, and looked at the year on the plate when I was really doing the research and trying to figure out which skirt shape was working that I determined, oh, actually it's from 1874. I was having the wrong ideas in my head the whole time. Okay, so now that I've showed you the plate, uh, let's see if I can actually talk and sew at the same time. This is a format, obviously, that's new to me, not that most of YouTube isn't new to me. Uh, if you hate this format, if you would much rather that I, like, just talk to you or just show you sewing, let me know in the comments, please. Uh, please let me know your thoughts either way. Anyway, so I first saw this plate about a year ago, I think, was when I got it. I don't know, maybe it was before then. But anyway, it first really entered my mind of that I had to make it about a year ago. And I, since I do plan out like a year ahead of time, um, it obviously wasn't going to be made right away, but it was something that I knew I wanted to shop for um, when I went down to LA as part of costume college. So we jumped forward to uh, late July of last year at Costume College, and I've done enough bustle dresses. I've done, I've done elliptical dresses even, so although I was thinking at the time elliptical measurements, luckily they're pretty much the same as bustle. Um, but when I was down at Costume College, I knew that I wanted to be looking for uh, ivory or white silk. I was flexible, um, but like a really kind of a white ivory. Um, and obviously this lo lovely burgundy velvet. Uh, of course, my first idea was I'd really love to work with silk velvet, but that sort of thing is not in my budget, unfortunately. So um, I knew it was probably going to be 
poly or rayon or whatever this did wound, wind up being a poly velvet, but it's at least a nice one. Um, it has a nice weight. It has a nice sheen. So anyway, when I was in the fabric district, I had already put the yardages into my head of what I needed. And so I went shopping for my fabric and I found the burgundy velvet actually pretty easily. I think it was in one of the earlier stores that I stopped in. Um, I want to say it was at fabrics and fabrics that I found it. Um, anyway, and so I got the amount that I needed. I don't remember exactly how many yards I got. I want to say seven. I normally don't buy less than seven for anything. And I knew that this was just going to be over skirt and bodice. Plus I got enough for an evening bodice. Might've been eight. Um, anyway, I got enough yardage and then I kept looking all over for a uh, white or off-white silk. And of course, as I've mentioned in previous videos, I don't have a lot of money uh, to budget for costumes. And so while I would have loved to make the entire underskirt all out of silk, um, with the prices that you get for solid silk and specifically for like ivory and white silk in, uh, well really anywhere, but even in the LA fabric district where stuff is cheaper, uh, it just wasn't going to be feasible. So I figured it's just the bottom of the skirt that shows the underskirt, which is out of frame right now, but the underskirt down here, it's just the bottom that shows and, uh, plus the sleeves and the sash that I'm working on here. So I wouldn't need that much. So I think I got, did I get five? I probably didn't even get five. It might've been less than that. I didn't get a lot of, of the um, ivory silk because it was expensive. I think I wound up spending um, at least $18 a yard on it, which is way above what I will normally spend on anything. Anyway, so I just got enough that only the visible parts would be showing. Now we fast forward several months later, this project didn't get started until like, I want to say December 28th or something. I just didn't have time. I've been working on, well, I was working on a lot of commissions. I was working on, um, sewing for my trip to Disney world last fall. So no historical sewing was done between, uh, costume college and December whenever I started this, December 28th or whatever. Um, so anyway, so I started, uh, started actually sewing the project. <laughs> so I usually like to work on skirts first, uh, just because bodices are annoying. Skirts are fun and, um, I don't know, take less effort and thought and all that sort of stuff. So I, uh, I worked on the underskirt first and most of the underskirt is actually, oh, I have it pinned here where I need to put the tapes on, but most of the underskirt, which you can kind of see right here, um, is actually just white poly taffeta from Joann's, as is the lining of the overskirt. I knew I would need to line it because otherwise it would just drape too much. I needed to give it a little bit more body. Um, Again, I've made a lot of this era, so a lot of this is just stuff that I have learned over time of what to do. So the underskirt is, um, it has the ivory silk over the poly taffeta. It's, uh, it's just up to here, and then I hemmed it, just turned in the top, and stitched it down flat as I, as I was building the skirt, almost like I was flat lining but only part way up. I did this approximately, I think it was 25 inches, um, including the hem turnover. And I did opt to turn the hem as opposed to face it. Uh, a lot of times I will face it, but the idea of that just sounded terrible to me. And I knew I had a little extra length. Um, so I just turned it twice and did a little like three quarter inch hem on the skirt. But uh, this skirt pattern is, I believe this is from period costume for stage and screen or similar-ish. I, uh, that's kind of my go-to, honestly, almost more than anything else. So this is one of my favorite books. Highly, highly recommend this book by Jean Hennessett. 
Um, it is so, so valuable. There's one for earlier too. And then there's a couple for like outerwear and stuff. Um, but the skirts in here, hopefully that's showing the skirts in here are wonderful. These are, oh, of course I'm showing you kind of the wrong era. Um, here we go. So they come on lovely gridded patterns like this. You can see a lot of my notes in there cause I've used these over and over again, just changing sometimes the length. Um, and obviously I first, when I first used them, I did draft them up to fit my size because, um, my waist size is larger and my length is a lot larger. Um, so you can see a lot of my notes kind of written in there, but I absolutely love this book. Highly, highly recommend it. Again, period costume for stage and screen. Pretty much all of my skirts are some variation of stuff in here. They're wonderful bases. And, uh, so that's what both of these are. I cut both of these skirts the exact same shape, but the underskirt I did two or three inches longer than the overskirt because A, I knew that the uh, overskirt was going to be pulled up anyway, um, so I wouldn't want all of that length, and B, even where it's not pulled up, I wanted a tiny bit of it to show. Um, it's really difficult to interpret a fashion plate that is seated, and this plate in particular is really weird because she is her torso is facing us and the side of her skirt is facing us it's not a uh, pose that a human could actually sit in but she's a drawing so they got away with it and that caused me some confusion when i was first trying to figure out what was going on because like it looks almost like it's an asymmetrical skirt which they didn't really do that's more of a 1880s thing that they did that um they did it sometimes but I also like symmetry I'm just a stick in the mud like that um so I kind of went on to Facebook and stuff and and asked people what they thought I think I might have also posted it onto Instagram which p.s follow me Lady Rebecca Fashions on Instagram so once I had determined what pattern I wanted to use I went ahead and cut out the skirts I cut the uh, underskirt first because I knew it was well, the one that I'd want to work on first. I was really excited about doing all of the velvet ribbon. Um, by the way, I think I have mentioned this on this channel and I've definitely talked about it on Instagram, but I did originally, along with purchasing the, or actually before I even purchased the burgundy velvet fabric and the ivory silk fabric in the fabric district. I also, at the marketplace of Costume College, um, I also purchased the burgundy velvet ribbon that I thought would be used for this project. It was 10 yards of burgundy velvet ribbon and I thought, oh, 10 yards is plenty. That's all I'm gonna need. Obviously I was crazy. But more on that later. So uh, so anyway, I cut out the skirts. I did the underskirt first, and I uh, I cut out the um, I the uh, the white taffeta poly taffeta first first, and then I used that shape to cut out the um, ivory silk that go that is on top of it. And I also don't. I never made like a paper pattern or anything based off of the Jean Hunnisett patterns. I literally just um, do it fresh every time. I take my ruler, my like 36 inch ruler and like my 25 inch ruler and I just, you know, kind of lay them. It's all like, not triangles because there's a waist, but you know, it's practically triangles and straight lines and all that. So. I just find that once I have all of the measurements written down, which I keep in the book, of what I'm going to actually cut, it's super easy to just lay the fabric out on my cutting table and like measure it out and cut it. That probably doesn't work for everyone, but I've been doing it that way for a long time, so that is uh, just what I do. In fact, actually, if anything, I find paper patterns for skirts so ungainly because you have to iron the whole thing, you have to make sure that it stays in place, you have to make sure it doesn't shift, it's, ugh, gosh, it's so annoying. Uh, <laughs> so if you haven't tried the whole just measure out your lengths bit and 
draw them out with a friction pen and cut them thing. Recommend it. Anyway, so I cut out those two and flatlined them together. I flatlined with my serger because I think it works really, really well. So I flatlined them together and then I built the skirt together. Uh, because of that, actually not everywhere matches up as far as like on the seam lines go. The This doesn't actually match up. I don't know if this is in the shot. Yeah, it is. Um, but you can see that doesn't actually match up. I don't care. No one's going to see that. It's uh, like, it's so... I did the silk part so deep and I'm never going to pull up the burgundy that far. So no one's going to see it and it doesn't matter. So after I flatlined it and assembled it, I hung it up and then started on the velvet. I did the same exact with the velvet it, that I did with the underskirt, except that the velvet is fully flatlined top to bottom. And also velvet is a pain in the butt. So just to warn you, if you haven't worked with velvet, even... I mean, I think velvet, unless it's made out of cotton velvet, then it's kind of okay. But otherwise, it is just a pain in the butt to sew. Um, it's annoying to lay out. It's annoying to cut. It's it's just annoying. And yet it looks so pretty. <laughs> I'm probably going to make another velvet project soon because there's a blue one that I've had my eye on. But um, anyway, so then I cut it out and then and hung it. But what I did differently with the velvet, because velvet does, I just walked into the room, um, because velvet does kind of droop so much, uh, what I did differently with this is that I did not actually flatline the bottom, uh, the hem. So I flatlined each piece, top, sides, and sewed them all together into the skirt, left the bottoms raw, because that way it could kind of droop wherever it wanted to uh, in between the pieces because, you know, these skirt pieces are pretty large. And I left that for the entire time, actually, that I was working on the velvet ribbon on the underskirt because that's what I did next. Oh, hi, Lane. Please get your paws off the silk. Oh, he is so good, but he is a dog. Yeah. You're on camera. You're on camera. Um, Hi, dirty paws. Oh, you're so cute. I get distracted by dogs and kittens, but she's not in here. Anyway, yes, lion. So once I had the velvet skirt assembled, I started on the velvet ribbon. And that's when I realized that 10 yards was a joke for what I needed for this skirt, like by a long shot. Um, so I went online and I looked for where I could get velvet ribbon um, at a good price, at a good shipping speed at uh, mostly the price because in a color that would match obviously um because i knew at this point that i think i think when i did my math at this point i realized i would need 55 yards for the skirt alone that sounds about right 55 yards so 10 yards was obviously not going to cut it um luckily i found it on amazon of all places didn't expect that and it was really inexpensive, so that was wonderful. So I bought three spools and uh, started on my gridding while that was coming. And so what I did was I gridded the whole skirt, the part, well, I gridded the whole underskirt that has the ivory silk on it um, up so that I, that entire area would be covered with velvet ribbon, even though it probably doesn't need to be because again I'm not gonna like lift up the overskirt that far but I just liked the idea of doing that whole section with velvet ribbon so uh it's all on the underskirt it's all um I think it's three and a half inch squares and uh it was a it was pretty easy to lay it all out across the back and also to lay it out all out across the front that said, there is actually a join. Um, it's out of shot, so I'll put up a picture on here. But there is a join at the sides where the front and the back meet because in the plate, all of the velvet ribbon on there is at a really nice diagonal angle, um, kind of more diamond, you know, as opposed to like square. So I decided that because I wanted the velvet ribbon 
to show all the way around the skirt and not just in the back, which is kind of more what the fashion plate is, I would have to have a join in the side or somewhere um, to be able to make it still diamond shaped all the way around because otherwise just the shapes of the skirt would cause it to go horizontal by the time it gets to the front. So, um, so there's a place where it meets and, uh, but laying it out was super fine and yeah, skirt panels are so big and flat and anyway, and then I just sewed it all on. I determined that, uh, it was easier to do with the walking foot on my machine because otherwise a regular foot, which is what I tried at first, it tended to have, um, have the ivory base bunch up a little bit underneath and the walking foot kind of helped with that. So there's still a little bit of, um, a little bit of like, not bunchiness, but it's not a hundred percent smooth, but I'm okay with that. Um, where it is, it looks kind of quilted ish. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't really bug me. Um, so I put all of the velvet ribbon in and I also, because it's poly ribbon, I was able to just melt the edges with, uh, I've got like a barbecue lighter type lighter. Um, and so I melt the edges, I melted that on the tops of the skirt and then I didn't really care about the hem cause I knew that it would be folded over and protected and it's not like it frays like crazy. It just frays a little bit. So, um, so yeah, one end is melted and then I just ran stitches down on each side of the velvet with the, uh, with the walking foot. And eventually I finished the entire underskirt. By the time I finished the underskirt, the overskirt had stretched out nicely and I was able to even the hem. And, um, I did hems on both the overskirt and the underskirt and, uh, oh, and I had done the waistbands way ahead of time. However, I did the waistbands still kind of thinking more crinolette. Um, so there were too far, too many pleats, too far forward, not enough pleats in the back to get over more of the bustle shape. So I did actually go in and wind up redoing the waistbands entirely. I took them off and redid the waistbands on both skirts, which, you know, it's annoying, but it's not like it's hard. It's just, I hate having to redo things. Um, but yeah, and then once I redid the waistbands on there, then, uh, and I did that before I did the hem because obvious reasons. Um, and then that was it for the skirts. So the bodice is my go-to bodice pattern that I've mentioned before that I created in a class of four years ago or so. And I did my mock-up, but I, when I do mock-ups for that pattern, I normally actually do them out of twill, which is what I flat line with because, um, I know that usually I can use them for the flat lining, uh, use the mock-up, I mean, for the flat lining and save myself a step and not waste fabric and all that. So that's what I did. I cut it out of twill and, you know, I did a couple tweaks to it. I think it was mostly neckline tweaks maybe some hemline tweaks that I did, um, just to get that shape right. And that's usually about all I need to do with that bodice is change the neckline and the hemline. So then I cut out my velvet. It was a pain and a half. I flatlined the twill to the velvet with the serger again. Also a pain. But I do find at least with that, the, um, if you put the velvet on the bottom side, as you feed it through the serger, and this is true for like any lighter fabric as you feed it through the serger when you're flatlining, that's usually better because the feed dogs help with that side. And, um, and I don't know, I don't know the, the science of it, but it's better. I, I, I find that that's a good tip right now. I'm working with Supima cotton and again, twill for the inside. Um, and again, like the cotton's on the bottom and cause it's squidgier and the twill, and it's cotton twill, but it's on the uh, top. Um, I digress. So I put the bodice together and then uh, the bot, okay, so this project is a little bit weird 
just timeline wise because I was trying to make sure that I always hand, had hand sewing to do first a rehearsal and now backstage of the show that I'm in. Uh, the show is called Let There Be Love. It's at Center Stage Theater for the next two more weekends uh, through the second to last weekend of February. And I will put a link below if anyone likes to get tickets. However, that said, don't come see it for me um, because I am only in about 10 minutes of the show, maybe 15. So because of that, I need lots of hand sewing to do in uh, backstage and in rehearsal and all that. So I was really doing this project almost with the goal of having hand sewing to do. But that said, I still machine sew everything that I can. Uh, so this project's order has been weird and almost kind of rushed in some way. Um, so there's stuff on the bodice that I actually wound up redoing because of that. For example, I did the darts and everything and did the neckline and put like trim on the neckline and then I did the, I turned the hem and I put all of the velvet trim on the hem. This, the velvet trim on the hem is by hand. The neckline I was able to do by machine and then my machine was like, no, I'm not putting velvet on velvet anymore. And so the... I did all of that by hand and then I tried on the bodice as I was marking my where I wanted the buttonholes and everything to be and it was like oh these darts are terrible so then I wound up having to redo the darts which of course in velvet um, there is a little scarring from the old darts which is unfortunate but it fits so much better now so it was worth it um, and then I did uh, the buttonholes and the buttons uh, which the buttonholes in velvet started really well, and then the last buttonhole is like, well, the, the first buttonhole I had to wind up doing as a four-step buttonhole, so that was annoying. And then the last buttonhole, they wound up being spaced somehow way closer together than the other two. Whatever. The buttons mostly hide it, so, like, again, I am not a super perfectionist with things. I would rather that it's, like, done. I just don't have the patience to redo and redo and redo, so this is how I sew. Uh, so at that point, after I did the closures and the bodice, then I did the sleeves because the closures and everything that gave me m enough to do backstage. And then the sleeves I knew would involve a lot more machine sewing because they again had the velvet ribbon. So for some reason I wound up like procrastinating on the sleeves a ton, I feel like with this project. And I think it was a lot with the hand sewing stuff too. I just didn't have to, I th think I got to the sleeves right around tech week. So I didn't really have machine sewing time like at all. Um, but I used the sleeves from the pattern, my go-to pattern, but the sleeves are not as reliable as my bodice pattern, mostly because I wind up doing like different sleeves for every project, I feel like, so they're not as tested. So I mocked up the sleeves using, with the class I have like the paper version of the pattern, but then I also have a fabric version of the pattern. So I assembled the fabric version of the pattern itself as my sleeve mock-up. And just to remind myself, because it's been a while since I used that sleeve pattern, so just to remind myself how far off it was. And um, it didn't actually wind up being as far off as I thought it was going to be. So with only minor tweaks, I was able to cut out both the sleeve lining and the sleeve itself um, of my fabrics. So the sleeve is lined with Supima cotton, and uh, it's just white Supima cotton from Joann's. But I really love lining my sleeves with like a cotton sateen or supima or whatever I have on hand. Um, I much prefer a sleeve that is not silk, like that is fully lined with cotton. And the light cotton uh, works really well because it doesn't add any bulk in the sleeve where you don't want any bulk. So, uh, and then I did the sleeve itself out of the silk. These were really funky to lay out the velvet ribbon grid on it was it took me like two hours it was like to figure it out I don't know why my, my brain was not wrapping around but I really was trying to have it meet uh, yeah you can see that to have it meet on the seam line on both seam lines so the way that I did this, because the inner arm sleeve line is the one that's more obvious if you're just like standing there since it's a two-piece sleeve, 
It's the one that's kind of more obvious. I actually assembled this seam first before I laid out the grid and uh, and then I put the I did the grid on and I do my grid all with friction pen and these are um, three inches three inch squares instead of three and a half because it's smaller and I didn't want it quite as big but uh, whereas this actually is three and a quarter so it's gradiated I guess three three and a quarter because this is where this will go and three and a half um and so I laid out my grid and like made it go across the inner arm just like it just went across but it was trying to make it meet on the outer arm I don't know why my brain wasn't functioning but finally I did figure it out and I really like actually the joins and you can see like this one is off a little bit because even though I then sewed it together and my lines matched up by the time I put the ribbon on some of it didn't, but again, impatient. So I wasn't going to sew it. Um, so I laid all the ribbon on that and then I did the cuff. The cuff is from a Butterick pattern. It is actually a 19 teens suit, but it had a nice thick cuff that uh, actually turned out to be way too big of a cuff. I wound up altering it down both for height and also for width because apparently the jackets on that suit think that your wrists are like really really big um, so I did wind up altering it down but it was a good base so it's a uh, flat lined with canvas which made this really thick um, and so I can barely get my hand through it but I can it's fine and um, I'm actually gonna turn this inside out if I can because what I did to help alleviate the thickness was instead of like having this edge be all finished and like meeting and everything. I know this is way far away from the camera and this is on a form and that's on a tripod. So um, what I did was uh, I actually cut some of the length off of the cuff after I turned it over and I just have the surged edges butting up against each other right here and at like above the seam. But because of that, it is significantly less thick than it would otherwise be so and then this also has the burgundy ribbon I think this one I was able to do by machine yeah I was uh, so I was able to do this this bur burgundy ribbon by machine um, which was nice but I did so the little it's just like some little crochet lace that I kind of gathered up and ruffled that into the cuff so once I finished the cuff um, or actually, honestly, I think it was before I finished the cuff, I did put bustle tapes in here for what I thought would work but to do the right, like, pull up and everything. And then I did kind of a mock of this, which is just that I used some really, really wide satin ribbon that I have, um, and put it around the skirt to see where, what I wanted it to do, where I wanted it to go. Because she's sitting, it's really hard to, like, guess where it's supposed to be, I guess. Um, so anyway, I mocked that around and I was like, uh, I put the muzzle tapes totally wrong. Like, <laughs> it would look terrible. So that is still a little bit up in the air. I have it kind of pinned up on this side of where I think I want the tapes to go. Um, but until I actually finish this, I'm leaving that off. So that's still a question mark. Obviously this dress is not entirely finished. So you will get another video at some point, probably around the Victorian festival of like me wearing it, but that's not today because it's not done yet. But I had so many requests for this video that I wanted to do it sooner rather than later, not make you wait like a whole other month. I took down the bustle tapes that I had already sewn in at that point, or most of them. I think this is, no, that's a pin too. So yeah, I think I took down all the tapes. Uh, except for the front. The front ones, I put two, one on either side of the front. They're not bad. I don't hate them. So those are still there. But anyway, um, while I've been working on this, because uh, this is actually just strip, a really long strip. It's like three of them. No, four of them, I think, of the, uh, no, it's stuck, of the ivory taffeta and backed with the Supima cotton. And then with the velvet ribbon all the way across. Again, this is a three and a quarter grid velvet ribbon. And um, I sewed all of that on. And before I sewed it on, like, again, it's just like flat line. So it's, I 
surged along the edges. What I'm doing now is I'm hand sewing all of the edges down um, on the inside. And then this will be sewn in where it's bustled up. And I think I'm gonna leave like kind of a little tail or bow down in the back. So I made a little bit of extra. It's not something that I can see on the fashion plate, but I liked the look of it when I mocked it up. Um, so anyway, that's what this is currently. And while I was doing the hand, while I've been doing, this is an ongoing, I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's really long. Um, yeah. So while I've been working on this, on the hand sewing, which I'm about like two thirds, three quarters of the way done at this point, I started on the chemise set. So in the last video, I mentioned that I don't wing projects. And then literally that day, I started on the chemise set for this project uh, because that was kind of like the last element of the plate. And I, I again, kind of asked the online hive mind if this was a piece that was gonna be sewn into the bodice most likely, or if they still use chemise sets in this era like they did in the Regency era, era which is what I was hoping would be the answer. And it determined that yes, they did in fact use chemise sets in this era. And I was like, yes, that'll be so much easier. So anyway, I found some Batiste in my stash and uh, where's it hiding? There it is. I, it's still a work in progress, but it is mostly done. And I think it's Batiste anyway that I found nice sheer. Um, and I just kind of eyeballed, looked at my Regency sh uh, chemise set and was like, okay, well, what would a back closing Victorian chemise set look like? Probably similar-ish. So I just kind of made square shapes at, or rectangular shapes at first. And then I wound up cutting in the inside to make it more of um, a narrow down at the waist so it wouldn't add any bulk down at the waist. I also, although I shared the entire piece originally, I decided that past like the curve of the bust to the top curve of the bust, basically where the top of the corset is, it really didn't need to be shared anymore. But having it shared right where the top of the corset is actually acts as a corset cover. And so it removes any lines from the corset. So I wanted that extra little bulk there. And then it gets to be nice and thin down at the waist. The back is just thin and flat. And this collar will have a ruffle. So that's what's left to do. But I'm hand gathering the ruffle. Uh, probably actually almost kind of cartridge pleating it like as if I were making a ruff ruff. Um, but it won't be as full. And then I will put the facing on and then this will be done. But it's just tied with a ribbon down at the bottom because this is how my Regency chemise set is. It's got a little channel um, and this ties down at the bottom and the back and this will have probably two buttons and loops. One right at the top and one probably a few inches down from there because anything farther than, than really the top couple inches is going to be way below on the back. So I don't really care, you know, if it's gapping underneath that doesn't, doesn't matter to me. So, uh, all that remains of this project is finishing this, the hand sewing on this and putting this on the dress and, uh, doing the bustle tapes for where this needs to go and just finishing the little collar bit on uh, a ruffle bit of the collar on the chemise set. And that's it. But anyway, I wanted to talk you through my whole process. <laughs> Sorry, this is a super, super long video probably. Uh, if you made it through all the way, just comment that you made it through because I'm proud of you. Again, if you go check out Lady Rebecca Fashions on Instagram and you scroll through the last like month of posts, you're gonna get a whole lot of in progress photos, a lot of which I will have popped up in this video too. So you've seen some of them at this point. That's about it on this project. If you have questions, maybe something that I glossed over too quickly um, or anything really at all, I mean, related to this project or me as a, sew a sewer or anything like that, um, please pop them down in the comments below. I do hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it wasn't too terribly long and just me talking and really not getting much sewing done. Um, but if you do like, did like this video, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. And if you'd like to see more videos, whether like this or not, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little notification icon to be notified every time that I post a video. 
and uh, I'll see you in my next video. Happy sewing!